Uh, I've had a, a joyful time putting this together for you tonight because uh, uh, even though I think I know the faith pretty well and uh, a lot of the things we're going to discuss are covered in the uh, uh, both the second and the fourth Rui study circles, uh, uh, and I've written about the history and so on. I'm finding when I have to present it, I pick up all kinds of things that I didn't know, especially because you have to uh, uh, do it, you know, present it in a sequential way and in a causal re relationship. So what happens? And of course, the difficulty is, especially here at the beginning, it gets even more complex later. But even at the outset, there's so many different things going on at once. Uh, so we started last week with the, uh, well, the week before, we started with events leading up to the declaration. Uh, that was pretty simple, pretty linear. And then last week, we dealt with the declaration itself, which, of course, is an important milestone in the history of humankind that has never occurred before and never will occur again. Uh, the point of transformation of humankind from its infancy and childhood and so forth to, to its adulthood. Uh, and so tonight we're going to see uh, in the, the topic I have for tonight uh, that you will see on, on the PowerPoint in just a second is the strategy of the Bob. And this is what I have learned uh, uh, more emphatically than I understood before as I put this class together, is that the Bob immediately takes charge. And you know, I was sort of under the impression that basically the Bob declares himself and then he's arrested and goes to Maku and then to Sharik and he's imprisoned and, 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 and writes a lot. What I didn't realize is that he strategically is masterful in the way he sets the whole religion in, in motion. He knows exactly what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. And I hope I can demonstrate that just a little bit tonight. We'll see some more of it next time as well. Uh, so let me share my uh, screen and um, sh uh, start the PowerPoint. Uh, the Bob strategy for the dissemination of the Baha'i Bobby faith. Uh, and of course, I'm talking about his strategy in general, but in particular, it's very strategic. You, you, if you recall, uh, with the Christian religion, Christ's instructions to his disciples was uh, go and teach all the world, but he didn't tell them how they were supposed to do it or where they were supposed to go. There was, really wasn't much of a strategy there. And of course, we have with the Baha'i faith in general and, and beginning with the, the faith of the Bab, a strategy in so far as uh, how the faith would get spread and, uh, and of course, eventually how the administrative order itself would be established. Uh, so we begin uh, with a... Uh, 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 an, another axiom, <laughs> uh, you know how I love axioms, uh, because again, they are the building blocks of sequential thought. And so this building block is about why a traditional historical critical approach to the Baha'i perspective can be misleading or even blatantly wrong. Now I've mentioned this before, but let me say it once again, as we get directly into the process of Baha'i history. What I'm talking about here is that uh, uh, the manifestations are acutely aware of history and the role they are playing in it. They are aware that they are, in effect, the, uh, the uh, executors of that history. The manifestations explicitly minister to the historical and cultural context in which they appear, and yet they aren't the results of that. In other words, normal historical critical approach from a scholarly point of view means you're going to study how someone is shaped by the time in which they appeared. The manifestations aren't shaped, they are the shapers. And this is something that most scholars would not accept as a point of procedure in studying history because it necessarily means you are including 
what my brother, the uh, phrase he loved, the interpenetration between science and religion, meaning you are accepting the fact that a divine presence, uh, namely the presence of, of uh, the Holy Spirit, is actually having effect on material reality. They choose where they will appear in order to have the greatest impact on uh, the furtherance of human history. And we read that, of course, and studied that last class where we read that the Guardian stated that they appear in the place that is spiritually most corrupt and in, in need of spiritual teaching in order to demonstrate the power of what they are bringing because they transform, if you remember the uh, passage last week, they transform uh, the people uh, who are in a perverse situation to become spiritual heroes and heroines. However, they are the impetus advancing human history, not the converse. Their teachings and actions are calculated to achieve the greatest effects and maximize their impact on history. Their teachings, laws, conduct are not determined by the social context of forces outside their own devising or wish, wish willful initiative. They are the makers of history, not the product of the times in which they appear. Uh, and, and it may seem like I'm hitting this pretty hard, and I am because I have been to, uh, uh, in the past, Baha'i scholarly uh, 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 meetings where uh, th this, where there was discussion, for example, of uh, Baha'u'llah made this law because uh, he grew up in this society and was influenced by this. They aren't influenced by anything other than their own decision and the influence and inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, working through them. But they are, as I said in, uh, at length in my book, The Face of God Among Us, the shapers of their own revelation. We'll get to that later. This can be a subtle distinction, but an extremely important axiom about the inter interpenetration between science and religion. The unity of science and religion is not something we strive to create, but rather a reality we strive to discover and incorporate an integration of our material aspirations with our essentially spiritual purpose. And we've, we've talked about that before. We will talk about it again, particularly as this axiom becomes manifest in the structure of the Baha'i administrative order. So uh, this is something we read last week. I won't read it again, um, but uh, uh, th this is a, the statement from Shoghi Effendi uh, about, uh, well, let me read this. To contend that the innate worthiness, the high moral standard, the political aptitude and social attainments of any race or nation is the reason for the appearance in its midst of any of these divine luminaries would be an absolute perversion of historical facts and would amount to a complete repudiation of the undoubted interpre interpretation placed upon them. So clearly and emphatically by both Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha. Um, and, and this is, is the part that uh, we read last week, uh, that uh, no more convincing proof could be adduced to demonstrate this verity than the fact that they appear among uh, Persia at a time of its spiritual uh, decline. So we begin with just this thought that occurred to me, and it's an obvious thought, uh, it may be to you, but it wasn't to me. And that is, I thought, wait a minute, we focus when we think of Carmel and the world center, we think of the shrine of the Bab, the primal point. Well, of course, that is the point, isn't it? That he is the primal point. He's the center of, as Shoghi Effendi says in one place, of nine concentral cir uh, circles that emanate from the pearl in the middle of that, uh, which is the primal point, the remains of the Bible entombed in this shrine. And of course, it's Baha'u'llah's decision that this would be the focal point, if you will, of Carmel. 
Uh, but it's interesting if you think about it, that this is the Baha'i faith and here the visual focal point is the point of its beginning, the primal point. Uh, and the beautiful statement here in this passage for just as the realm of the spirit in the realm of the spirit, the reality of the Bob has been hailed by the author of the Baha'i Revelation as the point round whom the realities of the prophets and messengers revolve. So on this visible plane, his sacred remains constitute the heart and center of what may be regarded as nine concentric circles, paralleling thereby and adding further emphasis to the central position accorded by the founder of our faith to one from whom God hath caused to proceed the knowledge of all that was and shall be, the primal point from which have been generated all created things. So that's amazing, isn't it? That, uh, that the uh, principal manifestation of the Baha'i faith is Baha'u'llah, and yet he gives this uh, incredible position uh, spiritually and even in this material symbolic sense to the Bob. And just this little note that I put at the bottom, I think is worth uh, uh, citing because there's so much of the Bob's writings that we have that are, are need to be translated and will be in the future. And there's, we'll get to that as we discuss the ministry of the Bob later. But the Bob revealed more than 500,000 verses during his six-year ministry compared to Muhammad's 6,346 verses of the Quran in the 22 years of his ministry. Now, of course, this is not counting the Hadiths, which in my belief, or at least my understanding, are really part of the revelation, though they weren't recorded as such. Uh, two things that I think you will find most valuable as we go along in our study of both the, Baha the Babi faith, its history, and the Baha'i faith. First, maps, and there are a bunch of them online, uh, and I'm going to show you the, the one that I think is the best uh, for our purposes for, for me. Uh, here you have the red line uh, emanating out uh, from uh, Shiraz here, showing the Bob's pilgrimage and then his return from pilgrimage. Uh, and then when he returns, he is taken to Maku, then Shariq, then Tabriz, where he's executed. That's his life. That's it. Uh, I mean, he goes to uh, Bushir uh, when he's a young man to work in his uncle's uh, shop as a merchant in Bushir. Uh, but uh, so his life is very simply remembered in this sense, but there are milestones along the way that we want. And then the orange line shows the life of Baha'u'llah, first exile across the mountains of Hamadan to Baghdad, uh, and then uh, his uh, trip to Suleimaniye in Kurdistan for two years and then his exile to Constantinople, and then his exile to Adrianople, and then his exile to Alka. Um, there's some better maps of, of the uh, journeys of Baha'u'llah. And you can see on this map, and this will be available on the slides, you have descriptions of what happens in each year. So it's good to be able to visualize what's happening in this especially in tonight's class, because he's going to go on this pilgrimage tonight. Here's another map that's a, a little less detailed. It's also a little blurry for some reason, uh, but the main cities involved um, in the life of the bomb. A second tool, and again, as I said, part of what I hope to provide you with uh, a main part of what I hope to provide you with, with this whole series of uh, classes and firesides uh, are tools for your further study, because there's nothing more, um, as much fun as it is to hear someone else uh, 
discuss something and bring up things you might not have thought of. It's even more fun to find them on your own. So another tool that's extremely viable is a timeline or a chronology. I'm going to put some on uh, one additional uh, tool I'm going to put on the site, the website, uh, is a uh, repository of um, various tools for your use, uh, pictures, uh, maps, and so on. So uh, the timeline or chronology, the Bob sets in motion a strategic plan in which many efforts and missions are occurring that should be simultaneously. And this is what I was talking about. Almost as soon as we begin, you have, uh, well, let me not talk about it until we get there. This fact explains the ostensible non-linear structure of Nabil's narrative. Many people find that, and I did indeed myself, very difficult to read the first time because it goes forward and then backwards and so on. And so there is a timeline in the volume, uh, but many of the uh, episodes and stories will go forward in time and then back in time, and it's hard to keep track of them. Many of the causal relationships among these events, especially during the heroic age, are spread out over time and have reciprocal meanings. And I'll explain that later. For example, Abdul Baha is born the night of the Bob's declaration. Certainly not a coincidence. A most accessible, the most accessible chronology uh, is a basic chronology from George Weinel books. Uh, and uh, uh, I will give you the... Uh, 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 website for that. They, they've got a newly created website and uh, it's much more easy to acquire books from them now. So let's go through a, a timeline uh, of this first part of uh, the revelation of the Bob because he has declared himself uh, and Let's see uh, some of the things that we will go back to later, namely his, uh, as a child, we uh, haven't discussed his uh, childhood, we will later. Uh, he works at his uncle's business in Bushir uh, from ages 16 through 21. Uh, for a couple of years, 40 through 41, uh, uh, he, uh, when he's 22 to 23, he studies under Syed Kazim and Karbala and Najah. Uh, and of course, no one is aware who he is at that point, that he has status, though there is one reference that uh, Syed Kazim makes to him uh, that we'll get to later. Uh, in 42 and 44, he returns to live in Shiraz, where he marries uh, Khadija uh, Bagum, uh, August 1st in 1842. Uh, he, uh, uh, they have a son, Ahmad, uh, though he dies in, in uh, early childhood in the, that same year, the 31st of uh, December. Uh, excuse me, that's Syed Kazim uh, uh, dies in uh, the 31st. Uh, um, the first intimations of his revelation that we've talked about, where he has this dream vision of imbibing drops of blood from the uh, throat, this, uh, the severed throat of the fourth Imam uh, of, uh, in Karbala. And then, uh, and this is interesting. Uh, that Khadija, his wife, recognizes the Bab as a Kaim. And this is, of course, before Mullah Hussein does. So while the Bab is the uh, Babul Bab, because he's able, as a male, to go out and teach the faith, she is the first, so far as we know, to believe in him, unless it was also his uh, uh, Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopian servant, Mubarak, whom you will uh, meet in just a minute. So, of course, uh, last week we discussed the declaration of the Bab on May 23rd. Uh, by the end of July, 
uh, the, uh, so two months later, uh, two months and 10 days, by that point, all the letters of the living, the remaining 17 letters of the living have discovered the bomb. In 1844, the Bob sends Mullah Hussein on a special mission to Tehran, though he has several other places he is meant to stop. He's a wonderful teacher, a magnificent teacher. Wherever he goes, he brings in uh, uh, throngs of people to the faith. And so he uh, goes on the special mission, which is a story unto itself that we will discuss, and that is uh, where he delivers the letter to him whom God will manifest, and he does uh, delivers it to Baha'u'llah. On August 1st, Baha'u'llah received that letter, not directly from Mullah Hussein, but from a student that uh, Mullah Hussein has encountered in Tehran. And Baha'u'llah immediately recognizes the author of this as the Qa'im, and he becomes a Babi, as does his brother, uh, Mirza Musa, uh, who is faithful to him uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, and the Baha'u'llah then goes about Mazinderan, the province of Mazinderan, uh, almost as a, a letter of the living, though it is important, as you know from history, that the manifestation before they are ready to reveal themselves, conceal themselves so that they don't uh, get killed, as most of the letters of the living do. August 11th, the Bab sends Mullah Bastami to proclaim the cause to the Sheikhis. Now, why is this important? Well, we'll read more about Mullah Bastami. He's the fourth letter of the living. And, of course, the Sheikhi movement begun by, uh, two lessons ago we learned, by uh, Sheikh Ahmad, their purpose was to recognize and proclaim the advent of the 12th Imam, uh, the, the, the hidden Imam, who, who would be the Qa'im. And so he goes to them and, and in effect says, it's happened, he's appeared. Uh, and so the Bob is very anxious to do that and see what their reaction will be. September 30th, so you see how quickly things happen. And this is what I'm talking about, how quickly the Bob puts things in motion. The, the Bob receives the letter from Mullah Hussein regarding Baha'u'llah. Now, this is while he is on pilgrimage. I mean, before he goes on pilgrimage, and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but in, in effect, Mullah Hussein tells him he's discovered one worthy of receiving such a letter. <clears throat> Already having arrived in Bushir, the Bob can... <clears throat> excuse me, now make uh, ready, that should be, to go on pilgrimage with Chodus and Mabarak. Now, Chodus, of course, is the 18th letter of the living, who has a special status uh, and was chosen by the Bab to go on pilgrimage with him. Mubarak is his Ethiopian servant, who uh, has a very important status in the life of the Bab, as we will see. Who is he? Well, this is uh, uh, something I discovered new to me. Uh, he refers to this servant, Mubarak, as he who raised me. And according to scholar uh, um, Saidi, um, Nadir Saidi, um, that he in effect puts him on the same plane with his own father. Uh, the Universal House of Justice on September 2nd, 2014, released an official authorized translation of the prayer in which Baha'u'llah, no, not the Bab, but Baha'u'llah liberated a slave, whether in 1839 or later, whether emancipating Mubarak or another, we don't know. But of course, it effectively liberated all slaves. It was, in effect, a, a statement that... Uh, slavery was uh, not appropriate. So let us read this, uh, this wonderful uh, prayer or tablet. Glorified thou art thou, O Lord my God. Behold how one slave hath stood at the door of another, seeking from him his freedom. And this despite the fact that his owner is himself but thy thrall and thy servant. 
and is evanescent before the revelations of thy supreme lordship. I testify at this moment as I stand before thee to that which thou didst testify to thyself by thyself, that verily thou art God, and there is none other God but thee. From everlasting thou hast inhabited the loftiest heights of power, might, and majesty, and wilt to everlasting continue to abide in the sublimity of thy glory and beauty. All, <clears throat> all kings, excuse me, <clears throat> all kings are as vassals before the gate of thy grace. The rich are but destitute of the shore of thy sacred dominion, and all great ones are but feeble creatures within the court of thy glorious bounty. How then can this thrall claim for himself ownership of any other human being? Nay, his very existence before the court of thy might is a sin with which no other sin in thy kingdom can compare. Glorified, immeasurably glorified art thou beyond every description and praise. O oh my God, since he hath asked this servant for his freedom, I call thee to witness at this moment that, that I verily have set him free in thy path, liberated him in thy name, and lifted from his neck the shackles of servitude, that he may serve thee in the daytime and in the night season, whilst I pray that thou mayest never free mine own neck from the chain of thy servitude. This verily is my highest hope and supreme aspiration and to this thou thyself art a mighty witness. Now, I'm not saying that Mubarak was a slave. He gladly served uh, the Bab. Uh, and this is a statue. Uh, it's a, a, a miniature. It's not as small as it looks. It's actually about a foot or so tall, the statue. But standing at the door of the Bob, and you see the door welcoming people into the Bob. And if you remember, he was uh, in the description of the declaration of the Bob, it was he who uh, opened the door. So, uh, uh, and it is he that the Bob chooses to go with him on pilgrimage. And he and Mullah Hossein, uh, not Mullah Hossein, and Khodus and the Bob are in constant communication and discussion during the two months of very rough travel around the Arabian Peninsula. So what are some of the immediate stories and events surrounding these first months of the revelation of the Bab? Uh, the 17 letters of the living arrive. The anecdote of the arrival of Codus, which we mentioned last time, uh, uh, where he approaches, the, uh, he recognizes the Bob before Mullah Hussein can introduce him and says, no need to tell me who this is. And where the Bob says, we have been communicating with this young man in the, the realm of the spirit. The Bob's assignment to Mula uh, Ali of Bastami, the fourth letter of the living we just mentioned, to take the news to the Sheikhis. He also becomes the first uh, martyr in the Babi faith because they don't like what he tells them and they turn him into the authorities and so on. We'll see how that coins, where that uh, falls into the chronology in just a second. The Bob's assignment for each of the letters of the living. He assigns each letter of the living to go back to his or her own. Well, there's only one her and she's not there. She's already in Karbala where she's teaching and uh, wherever she goes, Tahere uh, converts numerous people. Uh, they long to hear her speak. And so each of the letters of the living goes to his own province to teach the faith. Um, the Bob then gives a farewell address that is very uh, famous and very well known to the letters of the living. And we'll read a little portion of that later. Um, because he will never see them again. The special assignment for Mullah Hussein, excuse me, he says he, uh, that he, he will, but uh, let me get to that later. The special assignment for Mullah Hussein, we've already mentioned, to find him whom God will make manifest. The special assignment of Hodus to go with an own pilgrimage. 
So who are the letters of the living? Well, we're not going to go into great detail, but we'll at least uh, list them and see uh, the, what happens to them. Mullah Hossein, of course, the first letter of the living, the Babu Bab. He dies at Fort Tabarsi in 1848. Uh, Mohammed Hassan Bushri, a second letter of the living, and the brother of Mullah Hussein. If you remember when Mullah Hussein entered the gate, he had two individuals with him, his brother and his nephew. Well, the brother becomes a letter of the living. He is killed at the Battle of Fort Tabarsi. Uh, then uh, Mohammed Bakir Bushuruyi, he's the third letter, letter of the living, and the nephew who was the other individual that was with Mullah Hussein when he entered uh, Shiraz. Uh, and they waited for him at the mosque. Uh, he's also killed at the Battle of Fort Tabarsi. Uh, Mullah Ali Bastami, the fourth letter of the living, the first Baha'i martyr, I've just mentioned him. He was the one sent to uh, uh, spread the news to the uh, Shafi's. Um, uh, Mullah Khoda Bakish Kushani, uh, the fifth letter of the living, he died a natural death, but his son, uh, Mashi Yatov Lao, uh, later met with martyrdom in his youth. Um, the Mullah Hassan, uh, don't ask me how to pronounce that, but I will, I will say Bajistani. Uh, the sixth letter of the living, uh, Sayyid Hussein Yaz Yazdi, the seventh letter of the living, he is known as the Bob's amuensis. Now, if you remember, when the Bob was about to be executed, he gave instructions to his secretary. This is that secretary. Uh, and uh, he was with the Bob then the day of the, the execution. And he himself was martyred in 1852 when there was the turmoil after the attempt to take the life of the Shah. Uh, Mullah Muhammad. Radi Khan Yaz, Yazdi, the eighth letter of the living, he remained apart from the Babis. In other words, he remained a Sheikhi. So uh, th they were obviously tested, these individuals. And uh, this individual, where he never renounced his faith uh, and he taught it wherever he could, uh, he uh, wasn't fully involved as the other letters of the living. Uh, Sayyid Hindi, and as his last name implies, he was of Indian descent and he went to, was sent to India to announce the news of the advent of the Bab. Mullah uh, Mahmud Kui, the 10th letter of the living was killed at Fort Tabarsi. Uh, the 11th letter of the living, Mullah uh, Jalil Rumi, uh, was killed at the Battle of Fort Tabarsi. Mullah Ahmad i uh, Ibdal Mashragi, uh, 12th letter of the living, killed at Fort Tabarsi. Mullah Bakir Tabrizi, the 13th letter of the living, he survived all of the other letters of the living. He was the only letter to embrace the cause of Baha'u'llah, uh, in other words, to live long enough to uh, recognize Baha'u'llah, and he remained. remained a devoted uh, Baha'i. He accompanied Baha'u'llah to the Battle of Fort Dar Bar Tabarsi, and we'll discuss that uh, later when we get to the Battle of Tabarsi. But if you remember, uh, uh, it was on his way to the second time to visit the Battle of, uh, to, va to visit the fort that Baha'u'llah was arrested in the village of Amul and was uh, received the bastinado. Uh, Mulu Yosef uh, Ardibili, uh, the 14th letter of the living was killed at Fort Dabarsi. Mirza Hadi, the 15th letter of the living. Mullah Muhammad al Tazvani, the 16th letter of the living. Tahiray's brother in law killed at Fort Tabarsi. And Tahiray, the 17th letter of the living, who was, of course, executed um, and a very uh, touching scene, uh, and we will discuss her life in detail. Khodus, uh, who was uh, not killed, he may survive Fort Tarbarsi, but he was um, uh, killed 
horribly in the, in his native village. Uh, I think it was Sari, but I, I, it was in near, uh, it was in Mazendoran, I forget the name of the village. But it was only in the last few years that, uh, that the government destroyed, destroyed the uh, house that was a shrine to Hodus. So that's the, uh, the letters of the living. And this is just part, and and you should uh, of it. You should read the whole thing. It's as you can see, it's on page ninety-two of the Dawn Breakers. So let me take a, another sip of tea and try to read this as as uh, sweetly as I can. <clears throat> but nothing suffices. You're reading it on your own. Oh, my beloved friends, you are the bearers of the name of God in this day. You have been chosen as the repositories of his mystery. It behooves each one of you to manifest the attributes of God and to exemplify by your deeds and words the signs of his righteousness, his power and glory. The very members of your body must bear witness to the loftiness of your purpose, the integrity of your life, the reality of your faith, and the exalted character of your devotion. For verily I say, this is the day spoken of by God in his book. On that day, and this is a quote from the Quran, we will set a seal upon their mouths, yet shall their hands speak to us, and their feet shall bear witness to that which they shall have done. Ponder the words of Jesus addressed to his disciples as he sent them forth to propagate the cause of God. In words such as these, he bade them arise and fulfill their mission. Ye are even as the fire which in the darkness of the night has been kindled upon the mountaintop. Let your light shine before the eyes of men. Such must be the purity of your character and the degree of your renunciation that the people of the earth may, through you, recognize and be drawn closer to the heavenly Father who is the source of purity and grace. <clears throat> now, you may not recall that from the Bible, and that's because it's not in the Bible but the Bob knows that he says it. And so this is reliable and as uh, an authoritative source of what Christ said. So <clears throat> this is just a summary of, of what we've just gone over. Bastami is the first Bobby martyr. We'll see how that happens. Uh, four or were martyred in other circumstances. Uh, the story of Mullah Hussein delivering the letter, of course, and then afterwards he is killed at Fort Tarbasi. Kodus, I've just mentioned, uh, is at the conference of Badash, then goes to Fort Tarbasi and then survives that and then is killed. Eight killed at Fort Tarbasi, and of course the story of Tahire is saved by the Baha'u'llah, uh, brought from Karbala to his home in Tehran where he stays with Baha'u'llah. And if you remember the incident where she holds the uh, child Baha Abdul Baha on her lap uh, and said, calls him uh, the house, I think, doesn't she call him the house of justice or something like that? It's uh, some remarkable event. And then uh, the conversation she has with Vahid and the story of Vahid is he's not a letter of the living, but a very interesting story about Vahid that we'll study next time. And then her imprisonment <clears throat> afterward and her execution. So the strategy of the Bob is this. First, he decides that he will reveal himself by degrees instead of simply saying that he is a manifestation of song. First, he reveals himself as the return of the Kaim. Uh, I mean, the return of the 12th Imam. He is the Kaim. He will then go on pilgrimage officially to announce his station. Uh, so as, as uh, to make the sequence explicit, uh, you say, you know, why didn't the manifestations do this or do that? Well, here he's doing exactly what you would expect him to do. He's going to the Qibla, the focal point of Islam, and announcing at that holiest of spots, at the Qibla, uh, his station. He sends the letters of the living to teach their faith in their own provinces, sends Mullah Hussein to deliver the letter. He sends the fourth letter uh, of the living, Bastami, to Najaf and Karbila. Uh, and then uh, uh, he tells them, and this is important because he changes his mind and this uh, makes some of them 
um, not the letters, but some of the followers fall away from the faith. He tells them they will all gather together in Karbala after he returns from pilgrimage. So what are the important re uh, related stories for later? Uh, the story of the Bob's childhood, the story of Mullah Hussein delivering the tablet to Baha'u'llah, the story of Mullah Bastami, the story of Tahire, the story of Rahid, the change of location for the meeting. Instead of Karbila, he changes it. Uh, and uh, they don't understand that, some of the followers. The story of the Bab's return from Shir uh, uh, pilgrimage to Shiraz, whereupon he is immediately arrested. If you remember, he meets the, the party that's coming to arrest him halfway between Bushir and Shiraz. The story of how he ends up in Maku instead of meeting the Shah. And what that's talking about is that he is invited to meet with the Shah himself, Muhammad Shah. And uh, we've mentioned this before, but we will talk about it in depth, how he gets the uh, prime minister of the Shah uh, that makes this uh, not come about, uh, diverts this. He, the antichrist of the, of the Babi uh, dispensation. So let's talk in our last part of our meeting tonight about the pilgrimage itself. It has a, a manifold purpose. Uh, he, uh, 1844, October, now remember he revealed himself in May to uh, Mullah Hussein. And two months and 10 days after that, all the letters of the living have been received. Uh, after that, he sends them on their particular individual missions. Uh, and then uh, uh, the Bob leaves uh, pilgrimage by boat after instructing his followers to uh, await his arrival in Karbala. On December 12th, the Bob and his companions arrive in Mecca to perform the rites of pilgrimage. And his companions are Hodus and Mabarak. On December 20th, the Bab publicly declares his mission by standing at the Kaaba. Remember the, all of our studies of the origin supposedly built by Abraham and the Black Stone, uh, which is thought to be a meteorite. And by the way, I'm, in, I'm translating a poem from Tahire uh, today with the help of my translation team and uh, where she alludes to the black stone as having descended from the sky, from the stars. So it's already been claimed by some scholars to be a meteorite, and apparently that's what she's alluding to. Uh, so the Bob publicly declares his mission at the Kaaba, repeating three times that he is the Qa'im, which is interesting too, because if you remember, we've mentioned it before, and we'll get to it again, when he is four years after this, uh, excuse me, and uh, six years after this, at his trial, uh, he says three times, I am, I am, I am the promised one. December 20th, also, he sends an invitation while he's in uh, Mecca to the Sharif of Mecca. And the Sharif simply is a, a title of, uh, of uh, status, it doesn't have any uh, political meaning uh, or governmental uh, meaning. To embrace the new revelation, he is too busy to respond. And of course, that's quite ironic. Um, January the 16th, the Bab arrives in Medina after revealing uh, an epistle, the epistle between two shrines on the way. Another very interesting thing that happens on the way is that a satchel containing his writings is stolen by an Arab. Uh, and Khodus uh, suggests that they chase after him to try to recover them. And the Bob says, no, there's a mystery in this that uh, is God sent, that by his stealing these uh, letters, they will be disseminated in a way that could not have happened any other way. 
And if you remember, some of you may be familiar with a novel written by uh, uh, Bahia Nagjavani called The Saddlebags. And that's what that story is about. It's fictional, but it's superbly done. She got all kinds of uh, 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 awards and so on for that, that novel. Uh, February, we're now in February. Uh, through March for two months, the Bob disembarks. Now, this is the journey on the way home. Uh, he disembarks at Muscat, and we will see where that is. Uh, it's on the Arabian Peninsula, and remains there for two months until he is sure he has the news of what has happened to Ali Bastami, who, uh, what happens, he finds out. He was taken to Constantinople and is never heard from again. Uh, he was presumably killed. Late April, <clears throat> the Bob returns to Bushir, though much has happened during the intervening time between Medina and his arrival, which we will discuss next time. So if you'll see uh, here uh, is uh, the uh, town or the village of Muscat where he stops until he uh, hears what happened. So he knows what happens to Mullah Hussein's journey because he got he waited in, to, to depart from Bushir uh, up here. Uh, so they went, he and uh, Khodus and Mubarak went to Bushir waited till he heard back from uh, uh, Mullah Hussein, who was here in Tehran, a letter saying that he indeed had successfully completed his mission. Then they leave two months by boat uh, and uh, arrive in Mecca, then go to Medina, then return to Jeddah, where they embark, and then he gets off at uh, Mukak and uh, uh, gets in two months there and uh, receives the letter about what has happened to Bastami, and then he goes to Bushir. And so next time we'll pick up with some things uh, such as the um, story of Vahid, which is one of my favorite stories, and uh, probably one of yours too.